And now I'd like to welcome you to today's leadership and development webinar on communicating across your organization. I'm going to pass things over to our featured presenter today. He is executive leadership coach and professional development consultant, Mr. Brian Ackles. Brian, you now have the floor. Kelly, thank you so much for that. And uh, thank you everybody for joining in with this. Um, communications is probably one of my favorite topics and it's probably one of the things that we uh, have some of the biggest challenges with within organizations. So what are we gonna talk about for the next little while? So we'll have a, a few objectives for uh, the next 45 minutes or so. So gain an appreciation of why we communicate within organizations the way that we do. Uh, you know, how did we end up in the state that we're in and, and, and what is this transition state that we're in as well? We're also gonna talk about self-awareness uh, and how you, know, you need to understand how your own self-awareness affects your, how you communicate within an organization and how you communicate across the organization. And we'll look at different aspects uh, to communications within organizations. And as Kelly said, this is a very brief, a very brief overview uh, of some of the uh, some of the real critical areas of, of concentration and challenge for communication. So let's uh, let's jump right in and talk about why we are where we are today. So there was a number of uh, theories of management uh, that were developed in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, Taylorism, uh, Fayol, and, and others who who looked at how communi how organizations communicated and how organizations should communicate, and, and they came up with some some ideas and they came up with some ways that were efficient for the time. And again, we need to understand that for the time they were deemed as efficient. So the challenge, of course, is that management structures and management theories set up in the early part of the 20th centuries haven't changed a lot for many organizations. Now that's not to say that they haven't changed at all. Uh, there have been modifications and there are new ways of communicating, but you know, new technologies notwithstanding, how the practices that we use to communicate haven't changed as much as they probably should uh, in, in many organizations. So, where we are, what we have. So we have we have two basic models to look at for communications. And the first is the classical communication model. So many organizations are still driven this way. It's a top-down command and control style organization, and that is reflected clearly in the communications. So if we look at four different uh, areas of communication, content, direction, channel, and style, the content of communication is very task oriented. So you're, you're being told to do a specific thing. The direction of the communication is vertical. So you, it's, it's top down or reporting back up. It's not across the organization. How communications are, are handled, the channel for communication is written. Now, we've evolved written communication forms and channels from, you know, memos uh, and letters, et cetera, to uh, electronic forms of communication, of which there are many, but they are still written communications. And the style of the communication in this classical model is primarily formal. So as an example of this, you receive an email from your boss to say, okay, I need you to do the following task, um, by the following date for the following reason. Um, and it's a very formal, you know, it's, it's a thou shalt do this because I'm telling you to do this. And you respond back up and say, absolutely, I will do this um, within the following dates. I have a couple of, you know, here are the questions that I have for clarification. And then you receive clar clarification information back down. It's a very up and down written formalized type of communication which results in you doing something for your boss and your boss receiving the outputs of that something that you're doing. So keep that in mind it's because it's, it go, things go up, they don't go across. Now, many of us are still in organizations that function primarily that way. They don't go across the organization. So there have been other models that have been developed and, and, and I guess the most sort of general or generic uh, label for these would be the human relations communications models. 
And this really looks at the, the advent and the development of uh, human resource management within organizations that recognizes that, that people are social human beings, and that there's, which we are social in nature. So if we look at these four areas of communication, content, direction, channel, and style, again, but we relate that to the human relations communication model, then the content is both task and social. And I'll come to some examples of this in a minute. The direction is both up and down and across. And this is a, this is a very important distinction. And, and I'll give you some, some con contrasting information here in a minute. The channel and, and the type of communication is more face-to-face. -face. And it's not always going to be, you know, meeting with somebody to have a discussion about what needs to be done. There's still an element of written communication in this as well. But there's more discussion. And I guess that, that's really more to the point. It's, it's more discussion and back and forth about what needs to be done, why it needs to be done, who it needs to be done for, how it's going to be done, etc. So the style is less formal. So it's not a thou shalt do this because I'm telling you to. It's it's a it's an agreement and it's a discussion around amongst the stakeholders of the work that needs to be done. And that's an important distinction from the command and control structure. So the command and control type of communication is you do it because you're told to do it. Um, you may have, uh, depending on your, your position in the organization, you may have access to information to let you understand why something is being done. In the human relations communication model, it's more of a, uh, there's more of an understanding and acceptance at the organizational level that people need to understand why they're doing things, how what they're doing fits into the greater piece of the organization. And it needs to understand, it also understands and recognizes the differences in stakeholders. So you bring in people from affected groups into the discussion about why things are being done. Uh, and this is actually one of them been one of the drivers for uh, a lot of project management uh, applications within organizations. You're, you're bringing cross functional people together to work together to develop something to deliver something new. So if we go back and look at the command and control structure. So if I needed, if I if I was working in a, in a, in a vertical uh, within an organization and I needed information from somebody in another vertical part of the organization. My question would go to my boss. My boss would then contact their boss of the other vertical who would then contact the person who I needed the information from. They would supply information back to their boss. Their boss would supply it to my boss. My boss would then supply it back to me. Now, this may seem on the surface to be complete and utter nonsense. Uh, I can tell you uh, with no word of a lie, I have experienced this in, 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 a, in a major high-tech organization, that this was the enforced type of communication amongst different groups. There was no allowance made. In fact, it was specifically forbidden to go across the organization to, get, to gain information. Now, the other extreme side of the example uh, in, in the human relations communication model, and, and we've all read about Elon Musk and, and Tesla and how he manages his, his, his corporation. And uh, one of the things that he's very clear on is that you will contact anybody that you need to contact in the organization, regardless of your position in the hierarchy. If you need information from that person, it's my expectation that you will enter into discussion with that person. So that, that, wipes out the whole command and control structure. Um, so it's, they're two extreme examples, but somewhere in the middle, most organizations are now moving towards the uh, more of the, the task and social nature of communications. So obviously how, we've, how we communicate has certainly changed. Uh, certainly it's changed over my career. Uh, I've been in, in this industry, I've been in the technology industry and, and, and business for uh, more years than I care to count right now, but uh, it's certainly gone from the very beginnings of written communication, uh, literally on uh, you know uh, duplicated memos typed up by somebody in, in mimeograph, uh, through to email, IM platforms, uh, you know video sharing platforms from the from the very beginnings to uh, to what we have today with tools like go uh, like go to webinar, etc. Uh, file sharing through SharePoint, for instance, now, uh, short message service, uh, Twitter, uh, 
Instagram communication, any any type of communication you care to imagine is now being adopted and used within organizations. So all of this change means that we have to understand the effects of this and the effects of, of how we work on that communication. So, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the differences and some of the challenges within uh, some particular electronic forms of communication. The, the challenge is, is that one of the some of the implications for this, of course, is that the message can easily get mistaken. Short messages, uh, quick emails, a, a quick IM. It's very, it's I won't say very likely, but it's more likely that the intent of what you're trying to communicate will be lost because we're we're not taking the time to to think. We're not taking the time to craft a communication and understand that it's going to a different audience. So it, the potential for error is increased. And I know that we've all experienced sending a note to somebody. Send a quick email, a couple of lines saying whatever, you know, looking very informal, or sending a quick IM to somebody and it's completely misunderstood. On the other hand, it's also it's we send a quick IM, we get a quick answer, and it's very snappy, and we get the information we need very quickly. So there are advantages and dis disadvantages um, to you know the faster forms of electronic communications that we have. It's really the the, the part of this that I want to stress is that it's important to recognize the limitations and recognize the implications of using these types of platforms and where do care and attention must be taken. And we'll we'll talk a little bit more about this as as we move through this. So I want to get into the, uh, the more uh, nuts and berries part of this uh, discussion about communication and talk about self-awareness. And, and please bear with me on this because it, 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 it will come together in the end. One of the things about being in business uh, and being in businesses today uh, and understanding that you know, we work together as, as groups of people is that we need to become very self-aware. And we need to understand what our, how our different selves, and we'll come to this in a minute, really affect how we think and how we communicate. Understand our strengths and our weaknesses uh, and understand that how we respond to situations and how we feel about situations affects how we actually do things and, and how we create and how we communicate. So let's look at the total self. And the total self really is understanding the four aspects of, of what makes us a person. We have the physical aspect, we have the emotional aspect, we have the mental aspect, and we have the spiritual aspect. And I'll step through these briefly um, to give you an understanding about why this, you know, how this all comes together. So let's, let's talk about our physical self. If you are in pain, or if you are in distress, um, it increases the awareness you have on your physical body. And if you have physical discomfort, that can lead to emotional discomfort. And that can lead to your changes in your feelings. Because you're in pain, you're uncomfortable, you may be feeling a bit short, you're not really being able to pay attention to people as well. So this pain or discomfort can affect how we communicate and understanding that and understanding that okay uh, my back is really sore and my back has been really sore for a lot of weeks and, and, and it's not getting any better it's uncomfortable for me to be sitting down uh, and when I move I feel twinges of pain and someone comes into my office and, and they start talking to me and I'm not comfortable and I'm twitching and I'm moving around that affects how our communication is received so if we understand that and even saying to somebody, listen, I, I'm, I'm in a fair bit of pain right now. So, you know, my responses to what I'm saying, you know, how I'm talking and how I'm saying things may be a bit at odds with, with, what you, with what you think I should be doing. Even acknowledging that can help. If you're physically neutral, then your awareness becomes awareness of your thoughts and emotions more than you're not concentrating on the, on the physical side of what you're doing. So you look at your physical environment and you try and find a way in your physical environment to get yourself to be feeling physically neutral. 
everything. So you want to have a good place to sit, uh, access to good light, uh, access to good clean air, um, you know, well filtered, etc. So that that helps to and remove the physical distress and, and the physical challenges from your self awareness. So now we get into the emotional self. Um, we've heard at times in the past, you park your emotions at the door when you come to work. Well, you don't do that because we are emotional creatures. So this is this is what this is who and what we are. Um, emotions provide are, are there for a reason. They're there for a reason for us as human beings. Uh, it gives us information about our environment and it, it gives us information and motivation for what we want to avoid or what we want to embrace in that environment. So, I mean, if we feel good about something, we're going to embrace it. If we're, uh, if we feel bad about something or if it causes us, un if it causes us discomfort uh, or, or, or unease, we will try and avoid that situation. We can't avoid emotions. We can't avoid feeling emotions. You can't turn a switch and turn them off. Emotions are there. We need to understand them and we need to understand the effects that our emotions have on how we communicate both within, within our teams and also with others across the organization. And we can understand you know, how the physical side and the emotional side start to blend together. And again, we come back to the physical side in, in terms of discomfort and how it would change, how we're feeling, we're getting, we're feeling maybe a bit grumpy about things. So let's move forward then and talk about the mental self. Right, so your mental aspect is your, is your thoughts and your imaginations. Um, thoughts occur seemingly without your control. Right, sometimes a thought will just seem to flash into your head. And it's, it's, it's really interesting because we all have this uh, and, and we'll all be, we'll be sitting in a meeting and we'll have a sudden thought or we'll be driving and we'll think about something which um, had no relation to what we've been previously talking about or thinking about. People think in sentences, they think in words, they think in images, they think um, in phrases, like a kind of shorthand. And you have to understand that, you know, these thoughts that randomly can occur can distract you and also get distorted because they don't aren't accurately reflecting the situation that you happen to be in so i'll, I'll give you a quick example so you're in a meeting and you're uh you're talking or you're, you're listening to somebody present on a new uh, security system for uh your uh, for, for your it infrastructure and all of a sudden you know you you have a thought that comes into your head about well what about the guy on the street that does something weird to me? How does that affect security, security of myself, security systems? And you can start to distort the idea of a security system for your physical, for your IT infrastructure with a security system for a physical security system. And it, it, it kind of disturbs and distorts the message that the person is trying to give to you. So you can rein those thoughts in and say, just concentrate and just listen to what the person is actually saying. But understand that your mental self, these thoughts can occur. And you need to understand that these thoughts occur and park them. Now they occur for a reason, so you might wanna park them aside and investigate them later. But again, try and be in the moment of, what, of the situation that you're in and let these sort of random spurious thoughts um, and feelings, set them aside, don't ignore them, set them aside and come back to them when it's more appropriate. And then finally, we have the spiritual self, which is kind of ties everything together because this is this is the realm of what you value. This, this is this is your own personal worldview, and this is what motivates you. Okay, and it's about how everything comes together. So your spiritual thoughts, your spiritual self, really is this interconnectedness between your thoughts and feelings, uh, which is affected by your physical well-being as well, and your physical self, and that develops into your personal identity. So if we look at going back to this total self picture of spiritual, physical, mental, uh, and, and emotional, all of these four quadrants have an impact on how you think, how you listen, and how you communicate, and how you process information. Okay, so keep that in mind as, as we start talking about thinking styles. So how we think. Generally, there's, there's two gross categories of how people think. There's the global thinker 
and there's a linear thinker. Okay, and I've got an example I'll share with this in a minute when we talk, talk about the differences between these two. So global thinkers are the people that think in the big picture. They're interested in theory, they're interested in the concept, uh, rather than in the details. So they're looking at, at, the, at the end result as opposed to the, maybe the discrete steps of getting there. Whereas linear thinkers, they're interested in the details. They're looking at the step-by-step -step process for doing things rather than sort of the, over, the overriding bigger picture about why they're doing it and what the end, will, end result will actually be. There's neither good nor bad in either of these. There, there are implications to each of these in terms of how, how you think. And there are implications on how you communicate with different thinking styled people. And that's really what this is all about. If you understand the differences between global thinkers and linear thinkers, and if you understand the type of person that you are, whether you're more globally oriented or whether you're more linearly oriented, then how you communicate across to different people of different thinking styles, you can recognize and adapt and change to that thinking style. So one example of this is um, you're given a toy. So if you're a global thinker and you're given a toy that's in pieces, you look at the picture and you try and put the toy together based on the picture. And if you're a linear thinker, you'll follow the instructions step by step, right? Both of them have a different result, right? The toy that the global thinker puts together may not look the same as the picture or may look the same as the picture. They may do it very quickly. They may take them a little bit longer. The linear thinker will follow the instructions and as long as the instructions are correct, they'll get you to the end. Now, there's a, there's a really good example of a company who has taken this exact idea and blended global, and linear thinking into an instruction set. And if any of you have ever purchased from IKEA a piece of furniture that needs to be built in the last three or four or five, six years, the instructions are not written out. There are no words really, but they are a linear sequence of steps that you need to be following, but with pictures. So it's really a, a really astute blend of this type of style of, of how people think and how people work to get the, the global thinker, get the picture oriented person and the linear thinker in the step oriented person and try and put it together. So there is a way to blend this. And you know, Ikea got it right. Uh, for the most part, you can put together their furniture if you follow the instructions and you look at the pictures, um, it will end up looking like what it's supposed to look like on the box. Now, if you just throw the instructions away and, and have at it. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know if any of you have ever done that, but uh, I know I tried it once and it didn't really work very well. And I took it all apart and started again and followed the instructions, which are all available online, by the way, if you lose them. So looking at different thinking styles and, and how we address this, global thinkers appreciate each other's willingness to see the bigger picture. So if you if you're discussing things with another global thinker, right? You're going to both appreciate it and understand that you're looking at the big picture, you're looking at the end result. Linear thinkers will then take that and try and work together to build the steps to reach a solution. The challenge of course is when you put a global thinker with a linear thinker, that thinking style may not each person may not understand where the other person is coming from. So it's always incumbent on you. It's always incumbent on the person that understands this as a manager or as a leader within the organization to adapt your style to the person that you're communicating with. So if you're a global thinker and you know that you're a global thinker or you're, or more, you're more on that side of the spectrum than, than a linear thinker, because there's really no hard and fast line in any of this, and you're communicating with someone who's more on the linear thinking spectrum, right, you need to adapt your style and you adapt your thinking style to say, okay, well, here's, here's what we're trying to get to. Now, I need your help to understand the steps of what we how we have what we have to do to get to this end result 
So if you could help me understand how we can break this down into discrete pieces um, that you know you and your team can work on. And again, this is about communication, and this is still about making about getting work done. So all this is not just some hairy fairy conversation. This is about understanding and getting work done. You need to work with this person to say, okay, how do I get this? How do we get to this end result? You keep reminding them of the end result, but you also keep asking them for the discrete steps. And you need to be patient with them as they work through getting to those discrete steps. So you break the picture down. And if you're a linear thinker, you try and look at the end result and use that as a basis of your discussion. So if you're a linear thinker and you're dealing with global thinkers and you're trying to decide and define and get, get work done, you're encouraging them to, you're understanding that to look at the bigger picture, you need to take yourself out of your comfort zone and look at the bigger picture, but you also need to draw the global thinker in to a step-by-step piece it's like looking at smaller bigger pictures if you will in each step so that they understand that we have to do certain things in certain order to reach that end result that we're trying to get to now it's it, it is something that you can learn with practice about how you adapt but it's important to understand your own thinking style and how this always break how this breaks down to yourself so this all feeds into your own sort of interpersonal awareness and your self-awareness. You become aware and you become to a greater degree self-aware when you understand the dynamics of the organization and the dynamics at play when you interact with others. So the more you understand about yourself, the more you understand about how you react to situations, um, how your physical well-being, your mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being affects things, then the more you'll understand your thinking processes and your thinking patterns, and the more you'll be able to understand somebody else's thinking patterns. Now, some of the challenges of all of this when, when you put it all together is to say that if you're communicating with somebody and what you're talking about is at odds with your worldview or, or at odds with your values, that can lead in terms of self-awareness to physical discomfort, emotional discomfort, random thoughts, which can have a significant impact on your ability to effectively communicate with people. So you want to make sure that you identify those situations which are at odds with what you believe. That's very important. Um, and also take steps to address that. Once you understand and you have this awareness of thinking and learning and personality types. And, and there, there's a lot more behind this, of course, than what we've talked about so far. Um, you then have the responsibility to adapt to others' thinking styles, to others' learning styles, um, and that will make the communication between you and others within the organization that much more effective. And what we're trying to do, of course, with all of this is make communications more effective, make communications less prone to misinterpretation, uh, less prone to error um, and clearer and more concise for people. I mean, we all want to avoid endless meetings to talk about things. We all want to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what work needs to be done by whom and when it needs to be done by. Uh, all of this comes into play in communications, but it's up to us to adapt in our interactions with other people. So we think about different ways uh, of communication and, and one of the biggest things we can look at is listening. So listening uh, is, is one of the hardest things a person can do and it sounds trite to say it that way but it really really is. Think about what you've been doing while you've been listening to me for the last 30 minutes or so? Have you been truly concentrating on what I've been saying? Or have you also been thinking about other things and maybe quickly checking an email or looking at a quick text? The challenge with listening is you have to concentrate because multitasking doesn't work. 
our brains are capable of truly listening to what somebody is saying and doing something else at the same time. You will miss something. I absolutely guarantee it. Um, I had a conversation yesterday with a colleague, uh, and we were discussing uh, we were discussing one of my uh, one of my managers and his desire or whether he's going to stay as a manager or he's going to move back to his old job. He's in a temporary secondment right now. And it's a, it was a very important discussion. And, and this manager that works for me right now is on secondment from my colleague's group. And she has a challenge with an empty space that she has because she's holding a position open for him. So as she's discussing this person and she has great knowledge and great insights into this person and, and what they want out of their career, I have to had to make a very conscious effort to make sure I was listening to everything she was saying and not try and plan what I was going to respond to when she finished saying something. It's just concentrating on her concentrating on the words that she was saying and the information that she was trying to give back to me about this this person who is an excellent manager uh, but also has other desires and what he wants from his career so there's there's a, there's a lot of implications there's a lot of nuances to this conversation which is kind of immaterial to this but it was something that i had to concentrate on to make sure i got the information from her that was important for me when I then talked to this manager to say, you know, what, what is your, what do you want to do with your career? So we want to avoid interrupting people. We want to let people finish their thoughts. And that's really important because people will have different ways of getting to the end of what they want to say. Some people, it takes a few more, a little bit more time. It takes some more words. But it's important that you don't interrupt and that you give them the time to get to the end of their particular thought of at, at that moment. So spend 90% of your time just listening. And spend 10% of your time or less talking back to people. And what you're when you're speaking and it, in, when you're in a conversation with somebody and you're listening to them, and again, this is about listening. When you're speaking in that 10% or less of your time, you're asking questions to clarify, to probe for more information, to expand uh, on what was said so that you can gain a better overall picture. Because remember, if you're trying to give people the time to get to the end of their thought, they may think they're at the end of their thought because that's what they've thought about. That's what they think you should understand, but they may not understand that you're, uh, you don't have as much information as they do. So you're asking for more information so you can put it together in a, into a bigger picture. Unless you're asked for advice at this point, don't offer it. And if they want advice, if you're unsure whether they want your advice, there's a very simple thing you can do, and that's simply ask them if they want it. Um, unsolicited advice can be seen as interference. Now, this colleague that I was working with yesterday, um, the, the structure of the organization that I that, that, that I that I work with right now is um, she is the client-facing manager and I'm responsible for a technology that her clients use. Uh, and my, one of my teams is responsible for that technology. So it's important that I maintain a working relationship and she, a really good working relationship with this person. And it's very important that I understand that her, her concerns, and I'm not gonna offer her advice on how to deal with the customer, that's her job. Now, if she asks me for my advice based on my background, skills, and experience, I'll be certainly, I'm certainly happy to discuss it with her. And we have had those types of discussions in the past as well. But again, people ask, right? I don't offer unsolicited advice. And if I, if I do want to offer somebody advice, I will ask them, would you like me to share some of my experiences with you? Would you like me, you know, to talk about, you know, potentially different ways you could look at that? 
different ways of saying different ways of saying do you want my advice or not understand your physical environment uh, this meeting that i had yesterday was in my office in my office i have a desk uh, very simple and i have two monitors on my desk and a keyboard now unfortunately having two monitors on my desk and the way the office is set up people sit on the other side of the desk and I, I, I lose, you know, two thirds of the desk to my monitor. So I took, as soon as this person came in, I took one monitor, shoved it aside, right? So we've got room to talk to each other and we've got, you know, clear lines of sight we're, and we're not blocked by something. We're, I'm removing as many physical barriers as I can and trying to make it conducive to, uh, uh, to listening and conducive to understanding. Now, other times in this whole situation of, of listening and, and communicating, there are times when you need to take notes. And if you do, and, and there certainly are many times to do that, and I was in a, I had a meeting early this morning, a teleconference early this morning, uh, where I had to take notes. I, had, I was getting information from a, a project team that I also run, uh, and I have to make notes of what was going on because I can't remember all this stuff. There's just too much going on. So, as they were speaking, when it came to a pause, I say, just hang on a second, I'm just gonna to need to make a note of that and I quickly type out what they were saying and then I could tell them to continue. And it, it becomes a natural progression because I've worked with these people uh, before and they understand that this has to be done so that everybody's got a clear record uh, of what's going on. So these are seven ways that you can learn how to listen better and communicate better with people. And, and, and think of these, this is, this is a really strong checklist and a set of tools that you can use and when you do talk to people use their name um, I, I do this in restaurants all the time you know if, if you go to a restaurant and someone walks up to you said hi I'm Andrew and I'm gonna be serving you tonight I'll look at that person and say hi Andrew nice to meet you and thank you very much and when they come and do something at the table if they bring a meal over they bring the wine list over they bring a glass of water over thank you Andrew appreciate that Andrew can I get some pepper please use the person's name use inclusive language we us partners team don't overuse it though um, i deal with one guy in one of my uh, one of my uh, uh, vendor organizations who whose favorite word is team and every time he uses well team let's do this i, I, I want to reach out over the phone and strangle him um, so you know change it up a bit manage your own tone manage the volume um, smile be honest be attentive to silence and be polite that's very important. And unlike me, try not to speak fast. I know that sometimes my, my pace can get quite quick and I'm, I'm, I try and manage that, but I get very excited about some of this. I get very excited about what I'm talking about and I just, my, my pace goes fast and I, people start glazing over. But use the tone of your voice, use the volume and the pace. Uh, and, and again, it is said, be honest, be attentive to silence and be polite. When I say attentive to silence, when somebody finishes speaking, just stop for a second. You don't have to fill the void right away. And this is a, another listening skill. When they finish speaking, because you've been concentrating on what they've been saying, take a moment to think about what they said and phrase your response. So. Think about that in terms of your listening skills as well. Now, part of the other side of this communication is, of course, whole body communication. And, and we've heard this in different ways. In 1971, there was a study published on communication titled Silent Messages. 7% verbal, 38% paraverbal, and 55% body language. And, and we've all heard these numbers and we hear, you know, different stages, different numbers about body language. I, I know some people have said, oh, it's up to 80% body language. Well, it depends on what you define as body language. But verbal communications, what is verbal communications? It's the actual words that we use. Language, right? It's just simply the words. Verbal communication is primarily, well, it's not primarily, it's part of what you're, what you're experiencing today on this webinar. So verbal communication was, what, 7%. So then we have paraverbal communication, and it's how we say the words we speak. So the tone, the volume, the emphasis on the words, the emphasis on the phrases, the silences between phrases, the gaps in conversation. So 
if you think about this webinar, the information content that you're getting in terms of communication is made up of two aspects. It's made up of verbal and paraverbal communication. But what's missing in all of this, of course, is the body language. So you're missing 45% of the total communication package because you can't see me. So paraverbal communication and words become much more important in this type of environment. And we all use these types of environments to communicate within our organization. As simple as picking up the phone and talking to somebody, we understand you have to, or you need to understand that verbal and paraverbal communication is really critical and you need to up the ante and you need to up the uh, content of the words and the emphasis and tone, volume, pace, etc to make sure that you're communicating as effectively as you possibly can. Now we look at body language and you know body language, so gestures, nodding your head, shaking your head, moving your head from side to side, shrugging your shoulders, crossing your arms, tapping your hands, shaking your index finger, thumbs up, thumbs down, all of these things have interpretations and, and, and I, I won't go through the slide in, in that much detail to say what they mean, but I will make this comment. These are culturally specific. And this is really, really important in this multicultural and multi-generational society that we live and work in. So crossing your arms may or may not be defensive. Crossing your arms may be seen as being very attentive as well. Uh, and that depends on what culture, other culture you're dealing with. Shaking your index finger, well, that's a bit different. That can be, that, that's definitely seen as pretty rude. Uh, tapping your hands or fingers. I uh, don't know whether that has an implication culturally. It may or may not. Uh, nodding your head yes might be, yes, I understand what you're saying, but I have no intentions of agreeing with you. I'm only nodding to say, yes, I understand the words. It doesn't mean, yes, I agree with you. Shaking your head no means, well, no. Uh, what is shaking your head and moving your head from side to side? What is the subtle difference in that? Does one say no and one say maybe? Um, shrugging your shoulders to I don't know. You could just also just be, be relieving tension and trying to relax. So understand that body language and your own body language, which you can which you can learn to control if you go back and think about what we talked about in self awareness, will have an impact on your total communication package. So we thought we'll talk about written communications, and you know, written communications are those things. If you remember back in the, in the bygone area, and I'm showing my age when you actually you know wrote a letter, uh, longhand, on paper, and you put it in an envelope, and you put it on a put a stamp on it, and you sent it to somebody, or you uh, had somebody type up a memo, and that was then transmitted electronically um, using some type of crude technology, telegraph or uh, uh, or, or fax, etc. The thing about these types of communications and conversations was they were a lot slower and you had more time to reflect on what you were saying and there was you were less prone to making errors of speed, if you will. Now, IM platforms have introduced a new twist on this and they change how we do. Active listening, body language don't apply to these instant written conversations. But we try and we try and get past that by adding emojis to our to our IMs, to our emails, to our texts, whatever. And that's great as long as everybody has a common understanding of what the emoji means. And are they culturally specific? Is it culturally, you know, quite rude for one culture which is quite funny or quite uh, poignant for another culture. So, you know, be very careful with emojis. And are they adding meaning? Or are they just creating confusion and misunderstanding? So, you know, again, communicating across your organization and looking at how you communicate with people, using very quick communications is great. But if your organization spans countries, spans the globe, spans continents, understand the cultural impacts of what you're saying to people and how you're saying it to people. Do you share the same cultural references 
that you're alluding to within your communication. So keep your communications simple. Keep them culturally uh, agnostic so that you're not referencing something which is you know, unique to your own culture when you're talking to somebody primarily in, another, in a different culture uh, and understand the impacts of that. And if there is a sense of confusion and misunderstanding, deal with it immediately. Uh, there's nothing worse than having this drag on. So some simple rules. Before you hit send, how would you interpret the message you're sending? And it just takes a second. If you're writing a 260 character tweet or 240 character tweet, or you're writing a, a one line IM, just stop and read it for a second. Right? Understand cultural bias, understand, ask yourself, could this, be, could this message be misinterpreted? And again, have you thrown emojis in because it's cool to put emojis in? Or do they actually try, are they actually adding value to the content of what you're doing? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for you to make up your minds on this. So as we draw closer to the end of this, we're gonna talk a little bit about organizational awareness and understanding how information flows. And we talked right at the beginning about the command and control structure, the vertical versus the horizontal. And you need to understand it, and within your own organization, understand how information flows. Understand, so you need to gain an organizational awareness. You need to understand and build your own interpersonal skills and self-awareness. And all of this becomes part of understanding how communications work and how you can better communicate within your organization, putting all of these three things together. We'll talk about, you know, and this all comes back to culture as well. Uh, how do people react in different cultures? How do they communicate? Uh, are you top down? Are you, uh, are decisions made top down? Is it a consensus thing? Is it a committee, is it a committee decision making? Is it the last decision standing? Uh, or is your boss a bully? Uh, is the organization, does they, do they bully you into making a decision? Is it all based very clearly on, on pure cold logic, financial, customer centric, et cetera? Um, I worked in an organization in a country which I won't name where uh, essentially the admin assistant at the end of our co long and involved conversations uh, about issues would say, okay, so we're doing this. And she wrote down what she thought was what we had focused on mostly and that ended up being our decision. Uh, and it worked. Um, and you, it, you know, for the most part, we all agreed with it. And if we didn't, we, we certainly addressed it, but that was how decisions got documented. It was more you know, endless discussion, and then finally someone just made a decision about what we were going to be doing. So understand the culture of your organization and leverage that culture for effective communication. Um, understand who you should be sending communications to, um, understanding the best form to use for cross-organizational communications. Is it, is it an email to all? Is it a, a posting on an internal website? Um, is it uh, an electronic uh, a newsletter that goes out to people. Uh, how is the best way to communicate different types of information? And understand how hierarchy plays a role in your organization. I mean, if you are more control, command and control, and it is a more vertical styled organization, understand the implications of going horizontal. Um, and understand how people up the chain need to receive information and how they prefer to receive information. And again, one of the best ways to do this is to simply ask. So the effectiveness of communications, of course, um, the more effective your communications are, the less stress there is in an organization. The better your communications are across an organization, the better your relationship between departments, coworkers, different parts of the organization, divisions, et cetera, regions. Um, you will see increased levels of engagement within an organization as communication becomes more effective. And as you're more able to adapt your communication style, to the different parts of the organization. Productivity is certainly impacted by how effective communications are. The less misunderstanding there is, the more productive people will be. And that productivity is, is directly tied to people's ability to solve problems and meet their goals because they understand the information that is being presented to them and they understand how to communicate back with you. And that's, about being effective across the organization. All these tools come into play. So we talk about the factors in communication, how you communicate person to person, telephone, email, the number of people receiving the communication, the mass of the, mass of the audience. And the audience itself is um, 
that affects the message. You know, if you're sending something to everybody in the company, that will affect how you're delivering that information. If you're sending it to one person, that affects how you communicate with people. So you need to look at these three factors as you're crafting your communication, you're crafting ideas and plans and processes on how you want to communicate. And all this comes into an understanding about how organizations are structured in organizational awareness. And understanding the barriers to communication in terms of different languages, different cultures, the distance between people, the locations. Um, I'm dealing with one vendor right now whose project managers are offshore. Uh, and they're 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 actually they're they're based in India. Now they have an understanding and, and they have an understanding of the work that needs to be done, but language is a problem because the accent is very thick for the person that we're, one particular project manager that we're dealing with. And it is and it's a challenge, and it's a challenge for both sides. It's not just a challenge for us to understand this other person, but it's a challenge for them to understand us as well. So I mean Language is not just a one-way misinterpretation. It goes both ways. Um, distance in terms of time zones, locations, etc. All of these can become barriers to communication, which you need to familiarize yourself with as well. So a few last thoughts on communication strategies. Plan, 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 and plan. How you're going to communicate with other people, with other groups within the organization. And take time to understand how people prefer to communicate. Ask them, right? talk to them, find out what best works with them. And always adapt your styles to others. Don't expect them to adapt to you. It's always about giving, it's not about getting. And if you find something isn't working, change. Find out why it's not working. Maybe you've interpreted somebody as being a global thinker and they're really a linear thinker. People like to think they're global thinkers, but maybe they're actually more linear than not. Final slide, new technologies and new modalities of communication require you to have more soft skills, not less. You need to understand and be more attuned with people. You need to be a, more self-aware. You need to develop your own interpersonal skills and you need to understand your organization to a greater level than you may have had to in the past. You need to understand the whole organization. Put these skills into practice and it will benefit you It'll benefit your team and it'll benefit your organization. And know that everything we have talked about, everything that I've talked about today, and this is again just brushing the surface of this topic, everything we've talked about can be learned. This is not some, this is not skills that you're born with. These are skills that you learn and that you can develop um, through training, uh, through practice, through one-on-one uh, -on -one mentorship within your organization, etc. So with that, I will say thank you very much. I appreciate you taking your time with me. This is a, um, this is a fascinating topic of conversation. And if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's session. If you have any questions, feel free to type those now into the questions box, and we will get those addressed over audio. I also want to point you guys to our website at newhorizons.com. Um, there you will find all the information on this upcoming course, uh, communicating across your organization. The next class takes place on July 23rd. It is a three-day course. So if you're interested in more information on this topic, please log on to our website at newhorizons.com or contact your local New Horizons Center. Um, if you are not familiar with who your local center is, you can log on to our website and do a zip code search to find the center nearest you. Also a quick reminder that the uh, slide deck as well as a link to view today's recording will be emailed out to everyone later today so um, you can go back and review anything you may have missed or pass on to colleagues uh, who are unable to join or just have a great reference um, to go back to as well so uh, Brian thank you so much it looks like there are no questions on the topic okay. today, so I think we can go ahead and wrap up the session so thank you so much everyone and thanks again Brian for presenting yep. on behalf of New Horizons very welcome thank you all Take care, everyone. Have a great day.